Hello, welcome to our channel, where we set out to explore wonderful great works of literature. Well, dressed in elegant clothing because... Why not? Why well, the hell not? Why the hell not? Yeah, that's right. It was, yeah, it's why the hell not. <laughs> so it's been a while since we've been here, and uh, we're glad you've joined us this evening. Uh, today we wanted to uh, touch on a wonderful uh, book by a Nobel Prize winning author. His name is J.M. Kutze, and it's called Waiting for the Barbarians. Um, and just a little bit about... Uh, the author himself, he's South African. He was born in Cape Town in 1940. He's still alive. He's, I think, he's about 82. Uh, he lives now in Australia. Um, he is quite a renowned author. He won the, the slight winning the Nobel Prize. He's won many other awards. He's won the Booker Prize twice, the CNA Prize three times, the Jerusalem Prize, the Prix uh, Féministe Congé, the Irish Times International Fiction Prize. And he has all these doctorates and stuff. So he's quite a, a well-renowned... <laughs> and then on top of that, just all these doctorates. Yeah, honorary <laughs> degrees and whatnot. So he's quite the impressive figure. Well, mm -hmm. one of our, I would say, like Dostoevsky is one of his um, influence, uh, influences in his uh, in his writing. And he's kind of like the modern modern day equivalent of Dostoevsky, we would imagine. Yeah, so this was written in what? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, in terms of uh, specifically when it was published... 19... That's when he was born, 1940? 1940 is when he was born. I'm not quite sure exactly when this one was published. Oh, 1980. Okay, so copyright. not quite a classic. No, not quite a classic, but it's like a modern classic, if we want to call it okay. that. Yeah, it's we're going to make it work. We're going to make it work, exactly. <laughs> so, um, just to give you a just general background here, uh, it's a very slim book, so it definitely, um, I wouldn't say easy reading, but it does... Take a very quick time to get through. Although mm -hmm. we took our we took our time with it because it was pretty heavy going yeah. at times. Right? Yeah, it was very It's funny. quite a powerful book. Um, so it's kind of set in this um, unidentified sort of like colonial outpost mm -hmm. uh, somewhere in, in sort of the um, the plains or the the desert or however you want to imagine it, right? And it's sort of the out outer furthermost stretches of the empire, and uh, the the main character is kind of like this. A adjudicator, some sort of judge who's living in this outpost, and he's been there for many, 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 many years. Yeah, and there's been, for all the time that he's been on his like, post, there's never been any sort of conflict. Um, for the most part, they call them the, the natives or barbarians, right? They call them. Um, they keep to themselves, and then the community who's kind of moved there to themselves and everything seems to be for the most part there's just very few thefts yeah and so he's he, this um you can tell this uh, this main protagonist he's an older gentleman um he's kind of weary of sort of um he's kind of like weary of the empire we're and he's kind of like wanting to blend more with sort of the the native population the and the locals and he's kind of taken on there a lot of their Customs and their habits and their and their beliefs and kind of like the more easygoing attitude as opposed to the sort of the the capital the empire right mm -hmm. and so uh, one day uh, a Joe I believe is it yeah I think so. one of the one of the um, Joel Joel yeah so, so J L J O L yeah one of the um, sort of officers comes in from sort of from one of the districts from the capital um, and he's pretty much on um, a hunt to investigate sort of this barbarian invasion or some sort of like um, uprisings that might come about and some threat to the empire by the barbarian tribes that are surrounding this outpost. Mm -hmm. And so his manner, his manner and his um, attitude towards the barbarians is very much like they're the other, they're yeah. kind of like Dominating the enemy. Dominating and, and it's like this fear of the enemy. Like the one major theme they play with is this fear of the enemy um, and having such a fear and othering creates an enemy. Yeah. Um, in a self-fulfilling prophecy that the enemies will attack when you're so fearful. Yeah. And this almost like this absolute need to create exactly like you were saying, like there needs to be, um, there needs to be perceived enemy for the empire to function properly yeah. in a way. Right. Yeah. So Joel represents kind of the, the new wave of thought of, of kind of domination and young, a young new empire rising. Right. Whereas, the main character, which is what was well, we can just call him the magistrate. Yeah, the magistrate. Now. Okay, we'll just call him. The yeah, magistrate. we'll just call him the magistrate. Um, he is represented kind of the older generation of the empire. 
No, I would say I would, I would disagree. I would say not so much the older generation of the empire. He he represents almost like a complete turnaround from the mentality of the empire. Mm-hmm. The older generation of the empire would have still been building right, those still outposts. Still be part of the. I see. He's kind of what happens when you start to integrate into your surrounding. In a way. Yeah, in a way, he kind of like embodies that sense of like decay and the sense of weariness and world weariness that comes about through an empire that's lost its energy, mm. lost its desire to conquer and to uh, take over new lands and to have that full aggression towards the out surrounding territories. Well, it's it's expansionist. Like, it's almost like he doesn't believe in that action was necessary. Like he. He probably, when he was younger, went there with all the same ambition as this Joel, yeah. Joel person did in a way. Like, yeah. oh, we'll protect the people, a sense of, like, pride and um, the true soldier who's protective. And yet, and then probably over time, he realized that wasn't necessary. And, uh, you know, it, over time, he develops a sense of more, belo- like, he doesn't quite belong, he says, to the, his where he was born he, he ends up somehow like outside the empire team. and being more sort of understanding of sort of the the locals than yeah. he does of sort of the the yeah. values uh, of the empire itself right so like an outsider to both the natives and an outsider to his own people so this is why uh, a lot of times this book is actually equated with a sense of like anti-colonialism or sort of like a critique of the colonial mentality and sure enough there are strong elements of that as well um but i think if you strip back the onion you see there's so many more layers richer layers as well besides just a critique of empire um so uh, once again this this joel comes in this officer comes in and he goes out um to capture some of these sort of barbarians and he ends up like torturing them in order to get them to confess sort of their secret diabolical plan to overthrow the empire, right? And, uh, of course, you can tell, like, you know, the magistrate can also tell that, you know, these these people are generally innocent, and one boy was looking for medicine for his father, and or the father was looking for medicine for the boy, and that was the reason why they were where they were. And, of course, Joel doesn't believe them. And so when he uses these very punitive measures of torture to actually extract so- the so-called truth from from these uh, yeah. from these locals, the magistrate confronts Joel and says, like, you know, why why are you using these barbarous methods to yeah. do this, right? Mm-hmm. Why can't you just, you know, they tell you something, you ask them a question, they tell you the answer, why can't you just take that at face it's value the as the yeah. truth, right? Mm-hmm. And he kind of, like, has this very jaded, cynical um, approach where he says, you know, you know, I have a method, and the method is, you know, you ask a question, they answer, and then you kind of, like, squeeze a little tighter you know you ask the question again they answer you squeeze tighter yeah. and then again you, and then he's like by the fourth or fifth time then you get the truth yeah because he says it's only through suffering do you get truth yeah which is like it's interesting because they play again with that theme of the dark side of that that um how that can go wrong in a way right like you don't you don't seek truth through torture you don't seek through purposely penetrating and and prodding and creating suffering on another you sometimes can seek truth through your own suffering and through your own suffering that opens up curiosity towards the world around you and why things are the way they are and through that natural curiosity and experiencing suffering like the way the magistrate does throughout the yeah the story then he starts to see more of what is probably likely the truth right and throughout kind of like the story, you get a sense that the magistrate is trying to uncover, he's trying to research more into sort of the the tribes and the people's beliefs. And he wants to, he's searching for that, in a way, like primordial spirit that would keep him in contact, like at a deeper level, he would be able to resonate with, with these tribes that are always kept at a distance and othered. And Joel, on the other hand, you know, he's described with like dark sunglasses where you can't see his eyes. He's like this kind of like, blind adjudicator of justice that's you know compact like no compassion no pity nothing no remorse and comes in and like tears the flesh of of people to get to their essence to get to their souls to get to their tr- to the truth of what makes them up and so you get this dichotomy between the magistrate and joel but they're two sides of the same coin in a way but in a way they're both looking to reach out to that sort of the other. They're looking both to 
um, to interrogate the other, but one does it through your sense of like curiosity and self abandon and a sense of like and self curiosity, like the, yeah, like he he starts to abandon this idea of seeking truth through simply simply visual, visualizing others. It's like through this discovery of the self and of what his capacity is for capacity to endure suffering to endure torturing what he had is, has inflicted on others that kind of um realization of how you know he, for example he he sleeps with many young women and kind of just uses them for his own physical pleasure earlier on in his life and he starts to have a bit of disgust and remorse for that um and realize how that was how that affected his own soul Whereas Joel is kind of this embodiment of the lack of desire to learn of yourself and to strip others away um, in order to gain something, in order to try to to almost um, possess another soul over learning your own. Yeah, in That's a way, way those I dark glasses it. are almost like a blindness, yeah, right? Yeah, projection uh, you talked about. Like yeah. all of the things that he's trying to seek, it's, it's almost like a projection of what he lacks to know about himself. Yeah. And so Joel, like in this uh, horde of people that they've interrogated and tortured, there's this young girl, her and her ankles are broken through the torture and essentially um, and blinded and blinded. And the magistrate takes her in and he bathes her and he washes her feet and she ends up becoming, you know, I wouldn't want to say concubine, like she, she, she they, he kind of like has a sense in which he will take care of her and there's an opportunity opens up for them to become lovers, but yet he can't perform in a way. Mm -hmm. Like he, he doesn't have the desire to possess her in that, in a yeah. fashion. And what I found very striking about it was the sense in which, you know, he, he, he can, he can remember other people's faces of that traumatic event in that day when the, all the slaves came and they were tortured. But he can't, for the life of him, remember her face, what she looked like. Mm -hmm. And every time he looks at her, like there's a there's a almost like a void in her eyes, right? And there's an abyss that he just he can't. And you know they always say the eyes are the gateway to the soul, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a sense in which he cannot penetrate into her soul. And um, you know. And I I also yeah. see it. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I also see it as this like shift in. She was like, we talked about this. Oh, she's like, a, she was this catalyst for his self discovery. So it was like, she, through this genuine curiosity of this being and what she went through, um, unlike Joel, he didn't, he didn't seek to try to have curiosity truly about someone. It was through possession in a way. Mm -hmm. And so the magistrate, you know, as he's bathing her, help it seeing trying to see if there's any way i think a part of him to um perhaps somehow come to to terms with his own own in a way i guess contribution to her suffering because it's not like he stopped it from happening either not that he necessarily had the power to do that but he didn't even attempt to and he knew these things were happening so i think this was this catalyst of self-reflection um, she was where she walked in and she, he starts to you know nod off to sleep while he's washing her face asking questions her feet. like sorry feet sorry <laughs> his feet while he's like he does analyze her face he brushes her hair he he almost takes on this like fatherly type of love for her in a way yeah. and mm. responsibility so I feel like she was this catalyst of responsibility which then triggered this whole other kind of process of reflection yeah um yeah and so one day he just decides you know she ends up helping out around the community and in the kitchens and sort of you know i guess becoming one of the village villagers right yeah. in the town and they love her like they accept her. yeah they respect her as well and so one day he just says to her like you know you can either stay with me or i can take you back to your people mm -hmm. and so he risks that sort of trip and he takes a couple of soldiers with him and sure enough they go to the sort of the, you know wherever they whatever it would be the steeps or you know the deserts and uh you know they meet some people of her tribe and they sort of bring her back right mm -hmm. and they take her they eventually they eventually take her in this this other tribe 
Um, and when he comes back to the town, he's kind of like accused of sort of sedition or accused of sort of like uh, a treachery, yeah, like treason. Yeah, like collaborating with them to like to overthrow the government away of the empire to the, the, the tribe. Um, and I think the element there was that he didn't really tell his comrades about about what the purpose was of that trip because it was very personal. And again, I think he was trying to change this idea of needing needing to share everything to other people and, and doing things like he was a very private person. He didn't think it had anything to do with them and he knew it was just right and he knew if he said anything that they would probably try to stop him, right? Um, but part of that was... The interesting thing was that he was when he was passing her over to her people, he thought that this was like a gesture of, you know, that they'd be like, oh, open arms, the other tribe would be open arms to this young woman. And that wasn't the case. You know, they're like, oh, you give me your horse, you know, and the girl um, and we'll take her from you kind of thing. Like they were bartering with him, the magistrate, rather than what he thought would be the opposite of, of way around, like him doing this great gesture, which he knew in his heart it was a great gesture and a great risk. And they almost all lost their lives on that trip, right? And mm -hmm. A couple of times. So it wasn't an easy feat. He thought that the others would see that, but they didn't care, right? <laughs> they're just like, okay, well, give me your horse too, or we will kill you, you know, kind mm -hmm. of thing, because you clearly are in the worst for the wear. So that was kind of a, an interesting piece too. So that conversation that happened between the magistrate and when he was returning the people got misperceived by some of the younger, um, I guess, soldiers that were with him as being a communication of maybe perhaps secrets of the, of the empire to form a rebellion of some sort. Um, yeah. But that's what they just used. They didn't, never really tried to find the truth. They just, I think they were looking for anything to try to, yeah, because for he their was, cause. Right? He was already criticizing them for their, their methods and their cruelty yeah. and sort of the unjustness of the empire being so far away from the capital and kind of like, these are not your lands, these are these people's lands, right? And yeah. he was already very critical of that. And so I think they just want, they saw, they saw what he was about. So yeah, they, they just, to shut him down. they automatically just othered him as part of their group, right? Mm. Rather than listening to what he had, it, his experience and having um, respect for everything he had learned during that time there, they disrespected him. They did their own thing. He warned them, right, of, that they wouldn't, they wouldn't be successful. The young strolls and all the soldiers' egos were bruised when they weren't successful, and so as a way to kind of blame their failure, they put it on him um, is the way I saw it. Mm. You know, like their failure because he did warn them rather than, again, self-reflection being like, oh, maybe I did go wrong. It's like, no, you're you're wrong. Yeah, you're wrong. You 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 are the one who made me fail because you mm -hmm. told them something. Deflect it's deflection. Total deflection. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. classic deflection. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, he uh, gets uh, accused and he's awaiting trial. But in the meantime, he's set in prison. He's imprisoned the magistrate himself. And in a way, it's interesting because like the townspeople and villagers, they kind of turn on him. Like everyone's yeah, yeah, they don't really turn. They just don't really care. Like, yeah, in a way, they're all minding their own business, doing their own thing. You know, living their lives like and fear like fear coming to their. Yeah, and it, it, it was interesting to see like how someone could be there for thirty something years and be a beloved sort of like benevolent sort of type of person mm. there. I don't think he was necessarily benevolent until that no. point. He wasn't. You don't think like, so? No, they had their gossip about him too, right? Like. I don't think he was necessarily he wasn't a hated person, but he wasn't this like old benevolent person. He didn't do any great deeds while he was there. To he did for the people, like for the natives, but he didn't necessarily for the, his own people. Yeah, he kind of so. no, there was no history in there that I recall. Yeah, yeah. you know, he yeah. was just a, a normal. I guess he just had like yeah, he had the I think the redeeming quality of him is he had his doubts, mm. and he acted on those doubts. Yeah. And through his imprisonment, he also was tortured and he was hung up on a tree and yeah. all sorts of uh, depravity. All these horrible things happened to him. And um, and everyone just watched, you know, or participated in the like, oh, he can, like, they fed on the fear of this, this, the people attacking them. and believed, It was a mob mentality. Believed, yeah, exactly. They believed that 
the enemy was the natives, even though there had never had any conflict. There was no evidence to date of any conflict. Um, yeah. Yeah, and so then they just watch him be tortured in a way. Yeah, and so he endures it all. Yeah. And in fact, like, he becomes this, like, raggedy, almost like, lowest of the low in the entire village hierarchy yeah, he ends up some, being yeah it's pretty like pretty almost like person. a dog who has like fleas he was like kind of like no yeah. better than a dog with yeah. fleas running around right if you watch the movie there's a movie this was really good yeah but again it's the book is way more gruesome and i think honestly i think i mean it would be really hard to watch you get the essence of it from the film but i think there's something deeper that's penetrated in the writing of yeah. how gruesome the suffering is. Like you have to prepare yourself. But for it's it, but it's, it's also like it's also like it's also interesting because it wasn't necessarily graphic in the sense that it wasn't gory. It no. wasn't like descriptive well, in that sense. Well, I mean, sense. it was to a degree. But it, but it was like but it was yeah to a degree. But it's just like it's the it's the it's the context that it's makes it more breaking yeah aspect. it's soul breaking aspect of it. It's kind of like the same way we felt when we were reading uh, 1984 mm -hmm. and the, the torture scene at the end where they're like oh, two plus two equals five yeah and, and just, it's like uh, you just like you feel like every you feel your soul drop yeah 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 <laughs> but yeah. i guess like one of the things that wasn't really covered in the in the movie which by the way it was it's really it's worth really well watching done, yeah. um but that's really uh emphasized i found in the book is like this sense of desire and mm -hmm. because sort of the magistrate when he was taking care of this like um this girl he really desired, he, his body wanted to desire her, you know, mm -hmm. but he couldn't, he, he couldn't bring himself to do it. And it wasn't a necessarily a sense of guilt, but I think there's what, there was a sense in which he was like the microcosm of the macrocosm of the empire. Mm -hmm. Like it stretched out its borders and now it was retracting its boundaries, con, con, like almost like condensing in a way, contracting because of that, the, the desire is moving inward, right? It's moving back to its source. And for him, in a way, I felt like there was this impotence. There was this lack of virility, the, this way of not being able to penetrate, you know, even figuratively speaking and, mm -hmm. you know, literally speaking into sort of like the nomad, into the sort of like the primordial mentality, in, 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 into the sort of like, you know, the base of unconscious forces, I guess, that govern all human beings. And in a way, like, as hard as he tried to reintegrate into that, it was always a barrier. He couldn't remember her face. He couldn't. He couldn't visualize her. He couldn't see into her eyes. Yeah, he'd have dreams about and like, he repeated have repetitive of, dreams yeah. even after she had left, right? Yeah. And th that was kind of a theme from the beginning, where he'd be massaging her feet and falling asleep, mm -hmm. massaging her feet and falling asleep, asleep. And I saw that as also this, like, you know, the wisdom from something beyond, um, perhaps maybe. That like literally forcing you into your unconscious to yeah. process things that you haven't processed yet. Yeah. Um, I think there's so many things you could pull out from that, but the dream theme I felt was it kept dream recurring. Theme. <laughs> it kept recurring. <laughs> that rhymes. But yeah. yeah, that was a really, really cool aspect that you know I don't I don't really feel feel a lot of authors fool around with um, in this type of a book. Mm. Mm -hmm. I thought it was very neat. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of symbology in the book. Yeah. Yeah. And not and not no no like it was left up for interpretation about what that meant, right? There's no real clarity through dream, which I think is dreams can tell us a message, but we only we really know the what that message is supposed to mean for our experience. Yeah. And so the idea is that waiting for the barbarians is uh based on um the title seems to be based on um, a poem by uh, Kavafi, who was um, sort of an e Egyptian Greek uh, poet of the 19th century and early 20th century. And in it, like the, the poem itself kind of... Do you have it there? I, I brought it, yeah. I just don't have it on, on screen right now with me. But essentially, like instead of reading the entire poem you know, to everybody. I'm sure they can Google it and find it and read it for themselves. Mm -hmm. But in a way, I think this book really purely encapsulates sort of the theme and the messaging of that poem. In a sense that the poem says like, all the people of the city, all the magistrates, all the senators, they're kind of like 
waiting for the barbarians to arrive. And so they've given up everything they've sort of like held in high esteem. Like, mm -hmm. you know, the, the Senate's no longer meeting and they're no longer making laws. And then people are wondering like, why, what's going on? And the answer always is, oh, they're waiting for the barbarians. They're waiting for the barbarians, right? Because when the barbarians take over the city, they don't believe in laws. When the barbarians come to the city, they, you know, they, they want the jewels and they want the crown, but, you know, and there's this expectation of almost like, in a way, it's like responsibility of that decay in a way. Like you can tell it's an empire in decay. And in order for somehow for it to become reinvigorated or reanimated in a way, it needs that other to come and reanimate it. It's reliant on the, you know, the, this brutal primal force of the barbarian to come in and take over, right? And in a way, it kind of like describes an empire in its last stages of decline, or decadence, or it's just ennui, or, or something is gone there, this vital energic force. Mm -hmm. And it's the barbarians that kind of are like that impulse, that kind of like revivify everything, right? So all things are left yeah. to like But without decay. even necessarily doing anything, that's like until the very end they finally act, right? But it's like, well, we don't even know for sure. Well, in the book it's ambiguous because it ends in a dream. Right? Yeah, yeah. We don't, I mean, in a way they... Did they even really do anything? They just waited, right? Like the magistrate says, oh, they just wait. They just wait for us to kind of kill ourselves in a way. Yeah, yeah. They'll be here when like, we're long gone. It's like, who really was the barbarians, you know? who? Yeah, what are you yeah, really... You're question. waiting for yourself to become the barbarian in a way, you yeah. know? Yeah. Your own people to become the barbarian. It's not the others who necessarily are. Yeah. Yeah. No, that was a very interesting yeah. twist of, as well. Mm -hmm. So the movie ends in a sense like, you know... The, the, the entire army kind of like leaves, Joel leaves defeated, kind of crushed from sort of like the barbarians fighting back and the nomads fighting back. And then kind of like he looks off into the distance, the magistrate, and he just sees like a dust cloud forming on the horizon. That's in the movie. Yeah. In the movie, right? And the idea is like, you know, are the barbarians coming? Is that the barbarians? And I think the assumption is like, they'll leave it ambiguous, but it's like, seems clear that yeah, it they're, is. they're coming, right? And so anyway, there was this, there was this, uh, it, I think the movie ended quite beautifully as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but the uh, the book was much more ambiguous in terms of, you know, what happened with him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But it was a powerful, powerful book. It really resonated with us for, for a long while. Yeah, it's one of those ones that will sit with you. And I think it is one that you could reread and keep rereading and as you age and you discover your own wisdom <laughs> it'll come out through this the very um delicate symbol well, i don't say delicate but symbology uh, throughout the book yeah well worth it mm -hmm. uh how would you rate it i give it a five it was amazing yeah five out of five for sure yeah this heavy one. but good absolutely absolutely yeah, this isn't a light read <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, no 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 this is like this, this is, is like, like digging like... to the depths of the soul <laughs> yeah. yeah well anyway well, thank you all for joining us this evening, um, and uh, we have another review coming up shortly, and uh, we hope to see you there. And we'll give you our summer reading list next. Yes, certainly. Yeah. Take care for now. Bye-bye.